You have probably heard about the Mokro feud in the Netherlands, but this video is about a man that does not get mentioned nearly as much as all the others. The feud started as a result of a missing shipment of 200 kilos. The groups in the underworld of Amsterdam became each other's biggest enemies. Tensions were rising and no one was safe anymore. However, on the day of December 29th in 2012, the feud escalated. An incident took place in the Stadse Lumberta in Amsterdam, which was unheard of in the Netherlands. This incident caused two people to lose their lives. No one could have predicted the series of tragic events that would occur in the wake of this incident. As the little brother of one of them swore to avenge his brother at all costs, he started a personal vendetta that would take this feud to a whole other level. This had no longer anything to do with those missing 200 kilos. Let's dive into the story of Omar Lekorf. Omar Lekorf, also known as Suarez, is born in 1990 in Amsterdam. He grew up in a large family of 12 children. Omar was not unfamiliar with the police of Amsterdam. He had gotten in trouble for burglaries and robberies before. Other than that, there is not really a lot known about his early life. Growing up in a big family, Omar had many siblings, but his six-year-old brother Yusuf was the sibling he looked up to the most. Omar was inseparable from him. Yusuf wasn't a big criminal. He had been in contact with the police before, but nothing serious. Unfortunately, in December 2012, the worst imaginable thing happened for Omar. Yusuf got caught up in one of the biggest criminal feuds in the Amsterdam underworld. After a shipment of 200 kilos disappeared, two groups from Amsterdam became enemies. On one side, it was Camp Gwinnett's Martha. On the other camp, Ben Elf and Hussein. I've dedicated an entire mini-series to this feud, as well as separate videos discussing the key role players. Those are a must-watch too. I will link them down below. On the 29th of December, around 10.30 in the evening, Yusuf Lekorf was sitting in a Range Rover with Said El Yazidi, Ben Aouf A, and Rida Benajem, expecting to have a meeting with someone in the Stadse Elenbert. What would happen next is unbelievable and would be the events that would solidify the new generation of young and reckless Moroccan criminals in the Netherlands. As the four men are sitting in the Range Rover, multiple cars come racing towards them. All of a sudden, multiple men aim at the Range Rover. The Range Rover is hit more than 50 times Ben Aouf and Rida managed to flee. However, 21-year-old Said El Yazidi and 28-year-old Yusuf Lekorf tried to flee as well, but were struck fatally. Days after the incident, it became clear that the intended target was Ben Aouf A, and not Said or Yusuf. Omar had now lost the brother he looked up to, and the need for revenge started to grow. Omar was determined to get his revenge on every single person that was involved in what had happened to his brother Yusuf leading to a number of tragic events that affected many innocent lives. This determination also made Omar a target. He needed to be removed, just like his brother. What would happen on the summer evening of the 13th of July 2014, one and a half years after the incident in the Stadse Lumbert, can be deemed as a national tragedy. It was a disastrous situation where the underworld clashed with the normal world in shocking fashion. Unsuspecting 30-year-old father, Stefan E., was sitting in his blue Fiat Punto in the Konradstrata in Amsterdam. He just came back from watching the football game, the Netherlands versus Brazil over at his brother's house. It was quite late at night, so the streets were pretty dark. A man named Masod Amin Hosseini was in the same street as Stefan. He had a job to fulfill. He had to take someone out driving in a blue Fiat Punto with a certain number plate. And so he did. Masod ran towards Stefan's car and struck him several times. He fled away, and an innocent family lost their father there and then. After the police investigation was concluded, it became clear that Stefan was not the target. The intended target was Omar Lekorf. Omar lived right around the corner of Stefan, and also drove the same vehicle, a blue Fiat Punto. However, with a different license plate the shooter had made a terrible mistake. Shortly after the incident, the case was discussed in Opsporing Verzocht, a live TV show in which police cases are discussed in the Netherlands. Omar saw this and realized the pain the wife of Stefan must have felt and decided to go to her and offer his sincere apologies. With his legs trembling, he stood at my door, super young, I thought. A guy in jeans with a baby face, she recalled in an interview. Are you his wife? Omar asked. Yes, she replied. I am Omar, do you know who I am? To which she replied, yes, again. Omar got emotional and started crying. It took minutes before he was able to gather his emotions again. 
I saw you on Obsporting Versot, and I had to visit you, Omar said. I am so sorry. To which the wife said, but you did not pull the trigger, right? No, but they were after me. They came for me, Omar replied. Omar went on to describe what he did that evening. I came home at 1pm at night and was playing on my PlayStation. My sister said that there was a lot of police surrounding my car. I looked outside and did not see anyone near my car. There was a lot of police on the streets, so I went outside and saw you. So, while Omar was enjoying playing video games, an innocent family lost their father. This incident was not enough for Omar to reconsider his career path. It was already too late, and if anything, this incident meant it just became much more serious. In between August and September 2015, he started preparations to take down Nelfal F. Nelfal, better known as Nofel, was allegedly involved in the Stadse Ellenbert incident and was seen as the ruthless man who was in charge of planning hits on the group of Ben Auf. He fled from Amsterdam and stayed in Berlin to hide out for a while. Omar, together with three others, wanted Nelfal gone. Everybody leans on him, so many people. Nofel, 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 he is like a god to these people an intercepted PGP message to Omar read. I want him much more than you do, bro, believe me. That man got my brother, Omar replied. Omar and the others sent out a squad of four men immediately to Berlin after they received pictures of Naufal being spotted there. They stayed at their hideout, scouting and waiting for the right moment. The price on Naufal's head was high because they suspected him of organizing more hits on their group. He was a serious threat for them. A million euros were offered to the hit squad if they would successfully fulfill the job. He needs to go, go, go. Haha, <laughs> they are going to serve him a nice dish of lead. And, bro, do your best please. I will give you a big bonus. Bigger than what my friend just said. Real big, were some of the messages sent between Omar and the other orchestrators. In the weeks between August and September, Naufal was spotted multiple times in a coffee shop in a chic shopping street in Berlin. On the day it was supposed to happen, the four men were on their bikes armed and ready to go. However, Naufal never turned up. He had already fled from Berlin. Had he noticed anything? Well, what none of those involved knew is that Cedric R, the supposed shooter, informed Naufal via people who knew him that something was going to happen. An absolute anticlimax after months worth of scouting and premature excitement of the orchestrators. In court, Cedric admitted he tipped off Naufal and was not planning on actually participating in the hit. I just wanted to try and get some easy money. I played a game, he said. A very big disappointment for Omar and his group. And then there was a man named Aeneas Lomp. In the night of Saturday, November 7th, 2015, Aeneas Lomp met up with a friend, Danny M. In the city centre of Amsterdam, Aeneas had a serious reputation in the streets of Amsterdam. He belonged to Camp Gwinnett and was one of his most trusted men. If Gwinnett gave him a job, it would be done accordingly. Together with his friend Danny, Aeneas had a good time in the city as they were out drinking and partying. What he did not know was that Danny M, his supposed friend, had entirely different plans for the evening. Danny was on a mission to get Aeneas as drunk as he could, and he stood in direct contact with none other than Omar. As the night went on, Aeneas got very drunk and was going to take the train back to Kromeni. Danny texted Omar, I am with him, I will drop him off at Central Station. Omar in his turn informed his two hitters, Nabil and Hisham, who were already posted, waiting for Aeneas to arrive at train station Kromeni with the message, he is now in the train, get ready. 11 minutes later, are you ready? Yes, we are in the bushes, Nabil texted back. An hour later, still no sign of Aeneas at Kromeni station. Nine minutes past midnight, Omar texted Nabil, just got word that he will now get on the train. Make sure you are in the bushes at 55 minutes past midnight. Not having a clue of what is about to happen, Aeneas hopped on the train to Kromeni. An hour went by. Omar texted Nabil, Beware, he has a vest. Empty everything on him. 35 minutes past midnight. Omar texted, He is almost there. This is the chance. Nabil and Hisham proceeded to hide in the bushes again. Still no sign of Aeneas. He had to hop on a different train to get home. Hisham and Nabil started to get impatient. Nabil texted Omar, I am falling asleep in these bushes, man. We are freezing our balls off here. Shortly after, Omar texted, 100% he is coming. No mercy, please. Sometime later, Aeneas finally arrived and left train station Kromeni. As he walked towards his girlfriend's house, all of a sudden, two men ran up to him. And before he even knew it, he was fixed. That was the end of Aeneas. But why did Omar want him gone? Well, besides being someone from Camp Gwinnett, 
Aeneas was also allegedly involved in the failed hit on Omar, which ended up taking innocent father Stefan's life. No one forgets anything, and a year later, Omar returned the favor. He gone? Omar texted to Nabil. Bro, we emptied everything on him. We were running after him. It was not easy, Nabil replied. Omar, however, was not confident yet. But are you sure? Yes, bro, Nabil replied. Hisham and Nabil kept searching on Google the entire evening in the hopes of getting confirmation. The next day, at 4.25 p.m., the first news reports finally went online, and it was confirmed that the job was successful. The men sent each other texts cheering and were happy to bring another piece of the organization down. Omar got his revenge. Meanwhile, Omar was already planning his next attack on Camp Gwinnett. The brothers Shakif and Shahid Yaklaf had been moving in the underworld of Amsterdam for years. Both brothers belonged to Camp Gwinnett's Martha. Shahid already survived an attack on the 1st of November 2014. Now they were both on Omar's radar and PGP messages dating from the 9th of October 2015 show that Omar was planning something. Omar frequently texted with Don M. Don was incarcerated at the time but was allowed to go on parole each weekend. Don was happy to accept the job and would be accompanied by Franz H. Don requested two small ones and one big one, referring to weapons, and was promised by Omar to get 100,000 euros if successful. Omar had Hisham M deliver them to Don on Sunday 11th, October 2015. Hisham M later also sent Don pictures of Shahid and Shafiq Yaklaf, as well as a picture of Shisha Lounge Le Scenario in Utrecht. Both Yaklaf brothers frequently visited this lounge. Now, they just had to wait for the right time. A month went by. On the 18th of November, Don texted to Omar, I have never failed. Don is informed by Omar how Shahid is more important than Shafiq. But if Shafiq is there too, he may as well be cleaned up and retired too. And it would increase Don's earnings. The following days, the Shisha Lounge is closely observed, maybe a bit too closely, because on the 21st of November, the brothers and visitors noticed two men standing outside looking suspicious. They chased the two men away, and Shahid informed the police that people were after him and were most likely to do it at a shisha lounge le scenario. He went on to say that he nearly visited the lounge every day and that they were after him and his brother. After further investigation, the police found two weapons, a hat with DNA of France H and an earbud with DNA of Don M in bushes near the shisha lounge, which they left behind after being chased away. Just like that, the hit was prevented. Another attempt gone wrong for Omar. He was not about to give up that easy though. On the 31st of December 2015, Omar was about to strike once again. After the failed attempt, the Yaklaf brothers knew they were not safe anymore and went into hiding. A camping in a small town village became their hideout. Surrounded by other vacationers on a camping with surveillance far away from the big city, they felt much more safe. On New Year's Eve, two men arrived at the gate of the camping. They were wearing hoodies and hid every time a car passed through the gate. They had not seen the car they were looking for yet, a white Mercedes. All of a sudden, the white Mercedes drove up to the gate and instead of hiding, the two men brace themselves and start unleashing their weapons on the car. Shahid and Shafiq and a friend of theirs were in the car. Shahid accelerated the car in an attempt to flee, but unfortunately, it was already too late. He passed in the hospital yet his brother and friends did manage to survive. Omar orchestrated another successful hit, with Hisham M and Mohammed H as his hitters. They laughed about the incident in texts they sent each other. That other brother was almost gone too, Hisham texted Omar. Yes, haha, all of Morocco is talking about it. After Mohammed H and Hisham M did a good job, Omar happily put them on another job. This time, the target was Nordin A. Nordin was deemed to be part of Group Gwinnett too. He was also accused of having a role in what happened in the Stadsjellenbert and the unfortunate ending for Yusuf Lekorf. Thus, he was also part of Omar's list. A text from Omar said, I have been searching for him for years. This guy has organized the Stadsjellenbert. Omar told Hisham to observe Nordin. Mohammed H and Zakaria Z were supposed to fulfill the job. On the 3rd of April, 2016, Nordin sat in his car in Amsterdam, New West, as Mohammed A and Zakaria Z drove up to him on their bike. They had placed a tracker underneath his car, so they knew exactly where Nordin was. After confirming that Nordin was indeed in the car, the shooter unleashed his weapon. However, the weapon jammed after a few shots, and the mission was unsuccessful. 
I aimed at his car. I really did my best, but it kept jamming. One of the guys texted Omar. Omar was pissed, but still promised the guy something small for their effort. Time was ticking for Omar. He was involved in so many incidents, he had made so many enemies, that either way they would get to him first or the police would capture him. Omar knew he was in serious danger too and had fled Amsterdam to hide in Belgium. Despite his efforts to stay out of the hands of the police or his enemies, he was arrested on the 30th of June 2017 in Belgium. A month later, he was extradited to the Netherlands and immediately jailed for a minimum of 90 days for the suspicion of orchestrating the hit on Shahid Yaklaf. I think he knew a long time was ahead of him. Once in jail, Omar still was not safe from his enemies. On the 25th of January 2019, an alarming situation arose. The message was clear. Omar had to be transferred to a different jail immediately. Omar stayed at a jail in Klimpen an den Eisel when word got out that there was a plan to have him whacked in the prayer room of the jail with a weapon that would be smuggled inside. Guards immediately took action and brought Omar to an isolation cell for safety. The entire jail was searched for the possibility of a weapon. However, it had to be concluded there was none. It remained unclear how serious the threat actually was. He was moved to a different jail in Zutphen for safety. Omar was not keen on spending his entire life in a jail cell. The orchestrator he was, he planned a prison escape. In most cases, the intended escapee tries to escape the prison by himself, to be welcomed by accomplices waiting outside the prison. In this case, they turned it around. The accomplices, flown in from a banlieue in France, were set on getting Omar out of the jail by going in themselves. On the 19th of January 2020, the mission was set to take place. Inside the Zutphen prison, Omar had to do his absolute best to get through multiple rooms to reach a gate, where he and his accomplices were supposed to meet. Outside the prison, one of the four accomplices rang the bell at the entrance gate, saying he had a gift. A guard opened the gate and allowed him to leave the present between the entrance gate and the entrance door. The guard attempted to close the gate again. However, the accomplice put several doorstop wedges underneath the gate, meaning the door could not close anymore. At that point, another accomplice who drove in a van drove right into the entrance door and set the van on fire. Equipped with the heavy bolt cutters and a heavy duty grinder, they attempted to make their way to the gate they were supposed to meet Omar at. It looked like they were succeeding. While using the grinder power tool, camera footage showed the accomplices being eye to eye with Omar at the last gate. All alarms inside the prison obviously went off and armed guards came barging in. In all desperation, Omar tried to climb over the fence, but to no avail. The grinder was not strong enough to cut open the last gate. The accomplices took off, though it was not long before they were all arrested in a neighborhood near the jail, as they were seen switching and dumping their clothes. Mission failed. Shortly after, Omar was brought to Vught via helicopter. Vught is a jail with maximum security and considered to be one of the safest in the Netherlands. This attempt is a prime example of the boldness, self-confidence, and maybe even recklessness traits these guys have. Many would have figured the chance of this being a success was slim to none. Interesting to note is that attempting to escape from prison is not seen as a crime and will not cost you extra jail time in the Netherlands, as long as there are no new crimes committed. All in all, it costed Omar nothing. He will remain serving life. For the others, on the other hand, they did receive jail sentences of two years each. Strange how that works, right? Omar has always denied any allegations. He claims his innocence and says that he is not involved in any hits, did not send those BGP messages, nor did any other crime for that matter. After what had happened to his brother, he had nothing else on his mind than getting his revenge. Some say he did these hits for his group. Others say he did them purely for himself. Either way, he went far for this revenge. It had to happen at all costs. Had he gone the same route if his brother was still here? I guess we will never know. For now, he will be serving a life sentence given by the judges. This was the story of Omar Lekorf. If you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like, a comment with your thoughts, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Only takes a few seconds and is a major boost for the channel. Thanks, and see you in the next one.